also mesh process. Okay, it's great problem. Okay. Uh, the person that is outstanding and successful leader in business, you look here, uh, this will win after this one. I think I was so impressed that for the last hour, the company keep up. Uh, <laughs> oh, look at this one here. Otherwise, <laughs> that's why I saw it on the head. It's okay. And uh, uh, afterward, I see the picture. The governor has a picture with uh, the person. Can I? 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 Okay, anyway, I want to explore here. Please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Drew Greenblatt. I'm the owner of Marlin Steel. Uh, I bought a company uh, in 1998, but it was established in 1968. And uh, it's been a wonderful path uh, the last couple of years. Uh, when we first bought the company, it was a little bit rocky. And I'm going to tell you about our transformation from a company uh, that wasn't doing so great to a company that's doing a lot better. Um, just so you know, I'm only going to speak for about 15 minutes. Then I'm, we're going to have a rock star speak. His name is Tony Witt. For, he's formally sat in one of your chairs, and uh, he's leading our engineering department. Uh, we are really proud to have him here. Uh, he really makes Marlin great. Uh, we have a full complement of Terps, mechanical engineering grads, uh, working with Tony. Uh, make, taking us to the next level. We'll talk about that in a couple minutes, but I just wanted to introduce you to uh, Tony before we started. So let me tell you a little bit about Marlin. We import nothing. We make everything in Baltimore 100%. Uh, that's kind of atypical. Many companies import things, rebox it, and then ship it. We're unique, or we're, we're one of the few, that does everything there in Baltimore City, a local Maryland company. What's even cooler is that we then export it all over the world. We export to 36 countries, countries like China, Singapore, New Zealand, Taiwan, Australia. Matter of fact, we ship containers of steel wire baskets custom made to Australia from Baltimore. Think about how many wire factories or sheet metal factories are between here and Australia. We're growing fast in this terrible, terrible recession our company has been called out for, um, in, in the inner cities, for example, the 100 fastest growing inner cities. We were uh, in that elite crew. Uh, in, in Boston, we got an award, and uh, very proud of that. Uh, only six manufacturers were part of the big 100. This is companies from LA, Chicago, Philly. Against all these companies, we were in the top 100. In addition, uh, two weeks ago, we won the Inc. 5000 Award for fastest growing uh, companies in America. This is a magazine that just came out a couple weeks ago. Um, and we were number 162 in manufacturing. Just to kind of keep this in perspective, there's 223,000 manufacturers in America. Marlin was number 162. We're very proud of it, and it's because of our team, people like Tony. Let me scroll back a little bit. So the company was established in 1968. We made things like bagel baskets, real commodity products. Our equipment's from the 1950s. We sold it to bagel shops. And it was a very good business. The company made profit. Everything was hand bent, one at a time. Everything was welded, one at a time. Everything was cut by hand, one at a time. And uh, we had no engineering at that time. If you wanted me to do a reorder for your custom basket, we would say, hey, mail back the basket to us so we could copy it this is a basket we made, mind you, right? So we could copy the basket you just sent us so we could remake them again. That's how antiquated our um, engineering was. Uh, we paid our guys minimum wage. This is the day I bought the company in 1998. There was no health insurance. Our health insurance plan was you go to the emergency room. We had no retirement plan, uh, no 401k. We had no brochures. Uh, our investment, latest and greatest technology, we just got a fax machine. Two things happened right after I bought the company. I didn't see this coming, okay, otherwise I never would have bought the company. There were huge seismic shifts. The first one was China. China started commoditizing bagel baskets. They started bringing in bagel baskets cheaper than I could buy steel. So I couldn't rent the building. I couldn't pay a secretary. I couldn't offer benefits. It was an uh, unacceptable uh, 
uh, business model. It fell apart. To make matters worse, I don't know if you guys remember this, but there was something called the Atkins diet, which is a horrific experience if you're in the bagel basket business, okay? The Atkins diet, if you don't know much about that, is an anti-carbohydrate diet. You're not allowed to eat carbs. So what happened was everybody stopped eating bagels. In the mid-90s, it was a fad. Everybody was eating bagels like crazy. And you, know, you went from uh, zero bagel shops in Akron to five. I thought, well, this is great. I'm buying a company in 1998. We're going to go have 25 bagel shops in Akron. Of course, everybody knows that. Well, these two terrible things occurred. China commoditizing bagel baskets. And the Atkins diet came online. I was toast. And what happened was all my bagel shops started dying. My clients started buying from China instead. We started lo losing money. Not little money, lots of money. Everything was falling apart. It was a horrific experience. So really, we had two choices. What do we do now? Well, we had to either die and just fire all the employees. We lose all the money we used to invest in the business, to, to buy the business. Or we could do something different. We could transform. The problem is nobody sends you an email or a memo saying, oh, this is going to transform. It's simple. We were in a pickle, and it was bad, it was ugly, it was bloody, and we were losing a lot of money. At that point, I got a phone call around this time from an engineer at Boeing. And I said to him, uh, you know, how can I help you? What, what do you need? And he told me, well, I need a handful of baskets about this big by this wide, and I need them really quick. And I said, well, you know, normally I sell a bagel basket for 12 bucks. China's bringing them in for six. Okay, I can buy the steel for eight. All right. So 12 bucks is what I currently am charging typically for something of this kind of work. So I said, 24 bucks because it's a pain. It's a small number, and he's like, yeah, whatever. That was the epiphany, okay? That was the epiphany, is that you could have somebody out there that appreciates speed, appreciates uh, a, a custom design, an engineered design. So this was the light bulb that went off that really turned around and, and was our guiding path in the future. My problem was 99% of um, all of my sales were to these commodity markets. But we had to transform, we had to focus our business on more of the, <coughs> the custom engineered model. We had to migrate to a more precise thing because a guy at Boeing is not going to tolerate uh, you know, being off on your dimensions. See, when you're in the bagel business, if you're off plus or minus a bagel, that's cool, okay? As long as the bagel stays inside the basket, it works. Guys at Boeing don't think that way. They want to hear about 1 16th, 1 32nd, 1 64th of an inch, 1 1 28th of an inch, okay? So plus or minus a bagel don't fly. So we had to talk with our en these engineers and these companies, and we had to understand their fit, their form, their function. This is how we're going to be different than China. This is how we're going to add value that's going to differentiate us, okay, in this horrific uh, situation we were in. We had to figure out ways so we could find clients that would appreciate our value. And if we could hold delicate parts that are high value and we could rush it for them, then we could be different and we could win. So now, fast forward, we sell to guys like Toyota. We sell to Merck. We sell to Raytheon. And we're going to talk now about how we transformed. The, basically, the strategic change was QEQ, quality engineered quick. That's our niche. That's what we focus on. That's what we're looking at like a laser beam. Quality engineered quick. That's how we're thriving. We've used a couple other techniques. We recruit great talent. We also overinvest in technology. We focus on profits. We don't focus on revenue. A lot of companies out there will focus on big revenue. They don't necessarily focus on profits. Even though uh, big revenue gets into this, it doesn't, it's not the uh, milk uh, that pays for all of the investments and the marketing and things you need to do. We also uh, did a lot of lean manufacturing at Marlin. So when we talk about the strategic change, Everything we do is measured on, will it improve quality? Will it improve engineering? Will it improve our speed quick? So the reason why quality is so important is because it, it, it's, it'll get your reorders. The reason why engineering is so important is because if you innovate for somebody, price becomes less important. Price is, is less relevant. And if you're quick, you're fastest in the world, you'll win jobs you're not supposed to win. Let me give you an example. Two weeks ago, we got a phone call from a company in Texas that wanted to buy 7,500 baskets, and they got a price, and they had a purchase order all ready to go to China for $3.87 a basket, okay? And they needed them right away. 
So what happened was China said, sure, we'll ship it to you. However, it's going to be six to eight weeks, something like that. Four of the weeks, of course, will be on the boat. We said, we'll ship in four days. Okay? That won us the job. Okay? So that's quick. All right? So be even though we're more expensive, we can win. We can throttle China. And it's got to be because of these three metrics. So how do you have great quality? You have to demand excellence from your team. You have to have high expectations. You have to explain to them that this, we're a different company. We're going to be better quality than anybody else in our industry. We invest a lot of money in fixtures because that way that the guys can, the employees can put their parts into little fixtures to confirm that the, the part is just right. We have one piece flow. What that means is that when one person makes a part, they hand it to the next guy who hands it to the next guy who hands it to the next guy. Each person is doing a different application, and it's always uh, you always have one part deep into the process, as opposed to building mountains of inventory, okay, that might be a little bit off, and then it comes to the next guy, and he's like, well, I can't use this. All this big pile of inventory is all screwed up. You also have to have clear and transparent rules, so everybody knows every step of the way exactly what their project, what they need to do. We talked about engineering. We, our secret sauce is engineering. 20% of our employees are degreed mechanical engineers. We do things so that they could be like on steroids, okay? What do I mean by that? Every one of them has a 30-inch monitor. Matter of fact, every employee in our company has a 30-inch monitor. And we also have a second monitor. We have the best software for them. We do things like we give them stress software. So when uh, clients can say to us, hey, will it fall apart if I put 200 pounds into it? We have software so that Tony and his crew can double check and make sure that our systems will be robust. All of our competitions, like, I don't know, I'm not sure. Okay, That's the kind of engineering prowess that we're trying to offer that's different than everybody else. We train our talent. We spend about 5% of everybody's salary on training. Uh, it's a tremendous investment. Most companies don't do anything near that. They're less than a you know, half a percent. And we foster a very creative and brainstorming culture where we're talking with them and saying, hey, give us good ideas. And we're trying to, you don't shoot people down and you try to have a lot of good ideas come out. This is an example of the uh, secret sauce that we talked about. So what, we're, what you're looking at right here is a basket and we weren't sure how much weight it could hold. And you see the blue area right there is a part where it, it, it's going to be solid, it's not a problem. But when you put a lot of weight on it, it's going to start bending right around here, and then it's a disaster with the red area. Okay? But if you offer this kind of service to your clients, and you're different than everybody else because they don't have any kind of investment like this, you're going to differentiate yourself and you'll win even though you're more expensive. And like for example, there's a different job where we were putting a lot of stress against an area. We wanted to see when would this part right there break? Because once it breaks, the customers uh, in big trouble. So uh, that's we were able to provide these kinds of services. As we discussed, delivery wins. We have to be faster than anybody else. We have to improve our processes and our systems. So we're going. Our 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 beat is so much quicker. It's called tack time. Is so much quicker than anybody else that we can beat the uh, the competition. We do this also with overinvesting in equipment, and we have a standard operating procedure that's step by step. So everybody knows what they're supposed to do at what time. Another thing that we do that's different than a lot of other companies in our industry is we pay really well. If you do, you get what you pay for. You know, if you pay well, people uh, want to work for your company and uh, people are more enthusiastic about working with you. If you offer rich benefits, the, the, the employees are more engaged because they don't have to worry about their health insurance issues, etc. We offer everybody goals, very specific goals, and we have um, black and white targets of where we need you to hit with very precise deadlines. We have a skills matrix, so everybody can see exactly where they stand in the company, what skills they've learned, what skills they haven't learned. We post it in the lunchroom so everybody can see it. There's no mystery here. There's no, it's a very transparent group of people. And we have weekly bonuses, and these bonuses are tied to very precise production. Uh, how many baskets you ship, if you ship a lot, you get a lot of money. If you don't, you get zero dollars. So everybody's focused on hitting their targets. This includes the guys on the factory floor. It includes the lieutenants on the factory floor. It includes purchasing. It includes the engineers. So everybody has skin in the game. Everybody's focused. Everybody's the entrepreneur in the company, not just me. So uh, the bonus plan works out to be a lot, of, a lot of money. I'm talking more than a car payment and, in some cases, more than a mortgage payment. 
We have the new core hiring style. Uh, and uh, many companies are migrating towards this plan if they're going to survive in the future, which basically means you hire five really talented people, you pay them like they're eight, and then they will produce, because they're so good, they'll produce like they're ten people. Bottom line is people are the key. And you have to focus on developing this great talent because that's going to make you better and beat uh, the competition. Part of what we do is we're very transparent, as we mentioned. You have to be candid with your employees. You have to quickly tell bad news. You can't like hide and wait till the last second. You have to always under-promise and over-deliver. These are key attributes that will differentiate you from all your competition, you personally as an employee and you uh, in, in the business world. And whenever you have somebody who comes to tell you bad news, you don't shoot the messenger. You thank them. You embrace them for telling you bad news. Another thing that we've done that differentiates us is that we are focusing on technology. We're investing, investing, investing. Never taking a dividend, always putting it back into the company. So over the last couple of years, we bought a 3D bending robot. This is what you saw right here. Um, this is in Chicago being set up right here. Uh, this is the coils of wire that feed into the robot. Um, uh, we bought two of those. We bought a sheet metal punch. We have bought uh, a CNC mill. We bought a new press brake and a new laser, constantly reinvesting back into the company. So for example, this is that robot I just showed you in Chicago. And this is how we're beating China. So what happens is you can see the wire coming right out of here. This is coming out 492 feet per minute. And the bend head is moving 3,600 degrees in a second. These are parts we ship to Singapore, to Ireland, uh, Mexico, and you can see it bending all around. And then the last two bends it can't get. So we have this Japanese robot that we married to the Chicago robot. And then you can see it does the final bend right there. And then a second final bend. And then it puts it in this rack. And this rack loads all night long. And this thing runs 24 hours a day. We ship 700,000 of these a year. This is how we're beating China, because we have the best technology. And we have uh, great people that can program this and monitor it for quality. We also invested in uh, uh, CNC milling machines. Um, and recently, uh, we were working on a four-axis machine. Uh, this is a four-axis project right here where we're making parts for laser enclosures. Um, and Tony and another University of Maryland mechanical engineer uh, designed this. This is the four access part, and it's coming down right here, uh, 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 carving out the parts. We want to conquer new markets so we can grow, grow, grow. So we bought this punch. This is an American-made punch. By the way, the mill that we just saw was made in um, California. This punch is made in Connecticut. So we can make these uh, sheet metal parts right here. So right now what you're seeing is the sheet metal being loaded into the robot right here. Right over here, uh, these are grippers and they're going to grab it in a second. Now the suction cups let go, and now it's going to reposition this in a second. Now this punch is the fastest punch in the world. It punches 900 strokes a second, and it's 20 tons every time it comes up and down. Now right now it's just repositioning the grippers right here. And what's going to happen is you're going to start seeing it punching. That's 20 tons. It's like 10 cars coming up and down. That's what you hear. Okay? It's plus or minus four thousandths of an inch. It's moving the material eight feet a second. So Tony and other University of Maryland mechanical engineers right now are getting these parts from these designs from uh, working with the client, and then they're designing it right into the robot. And they're watching it happen from cradle to grave. This is not like, oh, you make something and then in two years it's made in China. We're making these parts. We're designing these parts, and Tony and his crew are inspecting it on the flight at Marlin. We're just changing the die right here. It holds 190 different dies. But this is how we're beating China, because we're able to ship faster and better quality. We also have automatic load and unload, so it can run all weekend long. But how do you go faster? Because sometimes those, that tooling that I described, the 190 little tool dies, take two days, sometimes it'll take three weeks to make. So how can we get from a DXF to cutting in minutes? How can we do that? We went out and bought a laser. Uh, this laser's made in Connecticut. 
Um, it could cut steel that's 0.6 inches thick with no tooling. Right now, this, is the, this laser's cutting parts. We bought this guy in November, and you can see it's cutting parts right here, and it's cutting parts with 2,500 watts and, uh, of light, and uh, it's, when it's cutting, it, it could, again, cut 5 eighths of an inch thick, and it could cut as long as a foot in a second. Um, this is making us much more effective and efficient and uh, able to ship all over the world. Uh, two weeks ago, we shipped a $96,000 order to a Japanese automotive company um, in Japan because of this laser. This is what it looks like. So now we're seven times bigger than we were when I bought the company 14 years ago. We've had six years of record revenue and profit growth. We're paying our average employee three times more than when I bought the company, and uh, I'm talking about the line workers, and our employees have rich benefits. And as I mentioned, we export all over the world. What's our future? More of the same, same playbook. Aggressive growth, more quality, more engineered, more quick, more robots. We're going to recruit more talent. Here's a couple books you should read. If you want to be able to talk to people that you're going to be interviewing with in a year or two, these are books they've read. And if you could spice up your interviews with these, uh, some, some of the words in these books, you're going to be different than most of the people that you interview against. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm going to let, turn the floor over to Tony. While we're waiting, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I went to the University of Maryland, like uh, Dr. Zang and Drew have said, and uh, I graduated in 2009. And my first job out of college has been uh, working at Marlin, and I started, you know, just as a regular engineer. And after a few years of working there, um, I was promoted to lead engineer. So now we have a team of five engineers. Um, all of them came from the University of Maryland, and um, all working together. And it's uh, been really great to get to work with other students who also went to Maryland. We have similar experiences, but yet they graduated after me, so they have. Um, you know, everybody has different talents and uh, <coughs> attributes that they bring to the team, um, which really helps us out, and uh, we're all good at different things. Um, so hopefully I can get this going soon. Why don't you describe the uh, cradle to grave? Uh, oh, um, yeah, one of the things that I really enjoy about working at Marlin um, is that, like Drew said, we get a cradle-to-grave product design experience. So in the very beginning, when the salesman talks to the customer, they'll get a list of design requirements and criteria. Um, usually once we look through it, we'll have a few more questions. So we'll go and sit down with the customers um, and the salesman, whether it's a face-to-face -face meeting or over the phone. And we try to flesh out all of the de design criteria. Um, you know, a lot of times customers don't tell you everything about their system just because there's so much to their machine or their robot, and they'll tend to leave out critical details, um, and so it's our job to really probe for that. And over the years, you get used to um, looking for certain things. You understand what, you know, the critical areas of the design are, and... Um, so from there, once you have all, all the details that you think you need, then we take um, Autodesk Inventor and we make a solid model and create a drawing. We send it to the customer and they'll go ahead and mark it all up. And we bounce the drawing back and forth until we can agree upon a design that works both for the customer and we can make for them quickly and efficiently in our factory. Um, one of the challenges with that is always understanding the limitations of the machines that we have. Um, and one of the nice things is that because the company invests so much into, back into our machinery, um, our capabilities are expanding every year. And we have more and more tools to accomplish the tasks that the customers are asking of us. Um, so from there, once we have an agreed upon design, our engineers will take that design and we have to break it down and dimension everything completely. For sheet metal, you have to make flat patterns. Um, so that way the factory is able to make every little component and assemble it completely. And everything has to be fully tolerant so that the final assembly comes together correctly. Um, 
and uh, also part of that step is creating a bill of materials uh, so that our purchasing department can get all of the materials in time. Um, after that, once the factory starts building, um, we, do what, we do a first article inspection. So the first piece off the line, um, the first piece off the line, we have, okay, <laughs> we get to go out and inspect, and then we also inspect a percentage of the lot after it's been completed. Um, so you get that experience of you draw something one day for a customer, and then within a few more days or weeks, you get to actually see it out on the line, and then you get to see it ship at the end, which is a really re rewarding experience. So um, like I said, I'm the lead engineer at Marlin. Um, some of the things that I wanted to cover, um, a little bit more in depth on what does Marlin make. Uh, you hear a lot about baskets, um, but we do more than baskets. And um, what is the job like at Marlin, uh, as an engineer at least, from the engineer's perspective? Uh, how do we use CAD? And then maybe a few things that you could take away uh, as far as tips and courses that I would re recommend. Um, so what does Marlin make? Um, we have four main categories, really, at this point. Uh, the first would be wire products. Um, these are things like baskets. Um, I have a heat treating process or I have a chemical cleaning process, and I can't just throw my parts into any old bin. I need them held in this orientation, and I need these surfaces exposed And um, when they go through this robot, and they're going to interface with my machine in this way. Um, so that's where a lot of our wire products fall. And wire is um, an appealing product for those kind of processes because it's round. Uh, only that tangent surface is touching the wire, so you can really clean a lot of the surface area of the parts. And it also allows a lot of fluid flow through the, uh, the parts holding container. Um, we also have a three-axis CNC router. We do a lot of internal fixturing and um, things like that to and I'll get into a little bit more detail on that. Um, but mostly we're cutting plywood with that and MDF. Uh, we have our sheet metal fabrication, which is one of the newer areas that we're getting into. Um, we have punching and uh, press breaks, um, like you saw on a lot of Drew's slides. And uh, laser cutting now is one of our newest machines, um, which really allows us to be very creative with our designs. Um, and then the other machine that Drew showed on his slides, uh, the 3-axis mill for machining. And like he said, there's a 4th-axis rotary in there, so we can do simultaneous 4-axis machining now. So getting into some specifics about the wire products. Like I said, these are all types of cleaning or heat treating baskets or just parts handling. Um, so that the bulk of what we do is actually in wire because we came from wire but we're getting bigger and bigger in the sheet metal and uh, machining areas. Um, the router that I mentioned, we have um, a three-axis CNC router, and <clears throat> one of the ways that we're always trying to get faster and, and better quality is by when we got this machine, we can create all of our own fixtures in-house. We make them out of plywood because um, it cuts out very quickly, and usually for the amount of parts that we're making, it holds up well. And then when we're done, we can throw it away. And we always have that program from the router. So if we need to, if that job comes back, we can cut that fixture out in an hour or two and get rolling. Um, we also make our own check fixtures. So rather than having an engineer with calipers and a tape measure out in the factory measuring something for 10 minutes, we can make a check fixture for them to check it in one minute. Um, and if it doesn't fit in that fixture, then we can probe in and figure out what went wrong. Um, so it's all about trying to get faster without sacrificing any quality. Um, something that we didn't initially expect was uh, actually we have customers come to us asking for check fixtures for their plant. So it's a lot cheaper to buy check fixtures and make sure it's right before you install it in the car rather than doing uh, rework. So uh, sheet metal fabrication, <clears throat> you see sheet metal everywhere you go. It's a very big uh, industry. And a lot of what we'll 
tend to do are um, fuel pumps, uh, housings for fuel pumps, I mean, um, and enclosures. Like, all of your computers have enclosures and housings. Um, and some of the examples of what we've gotten to do, this here, um, as I alluded to, is a enclosure for <clears throat> an industrial type fuel pump. It holds the uh, hoses and all of the equipment inside. And um, there's also a mounting bracket for an LCD screen and everything like that. <clears throat> so um, also the one in the top center there, um, I believe you have these in the, some of the computer labs here, but all the wires run up from the floor rather than having them run through the room. Um, this is the housing that goes in the floor and it holds all of the, um, the power plug-ins and the ethernet cables and everything. They interface through here and there's a plastic lid that goes on top that flips open so you can see it. Um, and then in the bottom center, we, have, we actually had a customer come to us and they said, um, I have a tablet. We have, they were a delivery type of company and um, they wanted their drivers to use tablets. Uh, to track where they're going. They could use GPS and track all the shipments. However, they were really concerned about people um, stealing the tablets. Not employees, but you know, they didn't want people to get in the truck while the employees were making a delivery. So we developed this box um, which locks the tablet inside and it has all of the heating uh, or ventilation to uh, dissipate heat, ventilation holes I mean, um, it's got a hole so they can still use the camera. It has mounting holes so they can mount it to an articulating arm in the dash of the car and uh, buttons to interface with all of the parts of the tablet. Um, oh, and by the way, you have two weeks to ship it to us. So it's, um, it can be challenging at times uh, because of the short um, production cycle, but at the same time it's very rewarding to in a short amount of time, develop something like this and have a nice product at the end that actually works. Um, which also can be a big challenge is that usually a customer is coming to us and they expect it to be right the first time, every time. So it's like a new prototype, but you can't mess it up. <laughs> I mean, if we do, then we fix it and we make it right and we catch it during production before we get it to the customer. But um, it's like every single day we see something new and we never know what we're going to come into. Uh, as far as machined products, um, these down here, they um, really don't look like much, but when you get into the tolerances that we're involved in making these, it can be pretty difficult to program the, uh, our mill and uh, hold the tolerances. They're actual machine components that go into larger machines, such as um, the machines that make cardboard boxes. I think one of them uh, is a motor mount and pulley mount um, for that type of a machine. And then over here on the right, um, I think Drew mentioned this one in his slide. It's an enclosure for um, laser sensing systems um, that actually track where trains are in the metro system and um, make sure they don't run into each other. And it basically protects their enclosure from the environment and all the dirt and grime in the tunnels. And, uh, you know, it has security screws and everything so nobody can get in there and tamper with the system. Um, so that was what you saw cutting on the mill. I know there was a lot of coolant, so you couldn't really see much. But um, it was rotating and cutting all of this, these pockets out. And uh, there's brackets and everything inside to hold the laser um, within the housing. So as I was getting into in the beginning, um, we get sort of a cradle-to-grave experience as an engineer at Marlin, um, which means you have to be a bit of a jack-of-all-trades. Uh, you know, you have your design aspect from the front end, um, and during your design, we have to take into account, um, I'm not sure how many classes you've taken, but I'm sure you've all heard of uh, DFA, DFM, DFX. Well, I didn't um, think that much about it when I was a student, but now that I'm actually uh, designing products, I realize how important it really is. Um, and it could be things as simple as making tabs so that we don't have to build a fixture on a sheet metal assembly so that when we don't have to build a fixture anymore to assemble it, they can just click it together 
and then weld it in place and it's going to be intolerance with the way we've designed it. Or um, another really big one is designing parts so that it doesn't matter which way they flip it, um, it'll be right or so that they can't put it in, assemble something in the wrong orientation. Um, sometimes we have to do tooling design uh, if customers if are demanding something of us that our current tooling can't do then we have to make tools to do it. We have the machines in our factory to make our own tools so sometimes we have to do that because um, our uh, vendors for tooling may not be as fast as we need them to be so we'll design and make our own. Um, also part of the design process as Drew mentioned was stress analysis. We're getting more and more customers that really want to have confidence in how much they can put in their basket um, and they need it to adhere to certain ASTM standards so we have to do our stress analysis on the front end um, to make sure we design it right so then and then when it gets built we also have to do our load testing before we can ship it to the customer that way they have hundred percent confidence that what we made for them is going to work and nobody's going to get hurt um, as an engineer, we also get to do a lot of the programming for the machines in the factory. The biggest four are our four-axis mill, the um, sheet metal punching machine, uh, the laser, and the router. Um, so some days when I'm tired of designing something, well, there's plenty of programming to be done, so I can switch over and program the machines in the factory and it's really neat to design something and then also do the program for it and then go out and you can see that program running in your factory um, making what you've just designed. Um, we also are all responsible for quality at, uh, at Marlin and the engineers role in that is to oversee our ISO system um, documenting all of our defects and taking care of customer concerns and complaints and uh, trying to get better every day. Uh, we also do the first article inspections as I mentioned and, and a percentage inspection or uh, we inspect a percentage of the final lot before it goes to the customer to make sure everything um, is as it should be. Uh, one of the reasons we really like to um, do that is because um, if somebody was if we only had one engineer responsible for quality and they're out for a day well we can't have our whole quality system go down so when we all cross train then it allows us to be flexible and react faster to the customers needs um, as you've heard everything's about quality and quick and so it can be stressful but it's also rewarding at the same time uh, work here at Marlin is a very fast-paced environment. Um, as I mentioned, this enclosure, we had two weeks to make a custom design, build it, and ship it, and it had to work. Um, so there was a bit of R&D involved at the front end of production where uh, the first design or two didn't work, and then we had to fix it right away and then get new programs out to the factory so they could make the new design. Um, as I've mentioned, we have the whole cradle-to-grave experience um, and, so to say, instant gratification, seeing what you've designed within a week or so or a couple weeks. So the way we utilize CAD, we have Autodesk Inventor. We use a lot of their products. Um, also, all of the CAD models that we create go into our programming software, so we don't have any rework, so to say. We don't want to redraw something in Mastercam when we've already done it in Inventor. And also, the design that goes on our drawings is the exact same solid model that goes into our programming. That way, there's no mistakes made there. Um, same pro, uh, software that we use for our router, laser, and punch. Um, we pull the solid models or DXF files straight from AutoCAD into our programs. Um, courses that I either took or saw as valuable when I was an undergrad, obviously, this is industry-specific. But um, enemy for 14, you're all here. It's really a valuable skill to have, and I'm sure once you get out there, um, you'll probably get to use it. Uh, well, it depends on where you go, but it, I see a lot of engineers use it pretty frequently. 
um, eNME 470 for finite element analysis. Um, we use it now, even before we had the Autodesk uh, stress analysis package. Um, that class still helped with visualizing and understanding how stresses work on uh, complicated assemblies. So I think that's a very valuable class. Um, also, machine design. Um, as I mentioned, we have to make our own tooling a lot of times, so that can be a valuable class to you. And production management. Um, it's, you know, basically it would help you with um, factor, being able to improve processes in our factory or in your factory, wherever you wind up working. Um, some tips that I would say as far as using CAD. Yes. Is each engineer responsible for several different jobs at one time, or do they usually have one specific job they work on per like, day? Or? Um, no, we're all working on different things um, and multiple projects. Um, we're not necessarily given one project, and that's Tony's project, and he's going to do everything for it. We try to schedule the work so that um, you have some consistency with one engineer following it through the production process because at the beginning in the design phase you have a little bit more insight into how everything should work and that's valuable at the end when you're doing final inspection. Um, but in any given day we're usually doing some design work, a little bit of programming as well as drawing releases for the factory. Um, it's all just, it depends on how many uh, new jobs versus um, jobs going into the factory we have. Uh, yep. As you invest in like this new technology, do you guys have a lot more machining to do as the engineers, or is like the other people in the floor getting more training for? Um, usually, we train some of the engineers as well as the guys on the floor, because um, just because we wrote the program, we also need uh, someone in the shop to be an operator. Um, and also, if the engineers aren't available for some reason, the operators can also do some programming out in the factory at the podium of the machine. So um, we do train both engineers and the factory workers. Yes? Um, I wasn't part of the uh, decision process. They had it when I started working there. Um, and. When I was going through this class uh, during my undergrad, we didn't use Autodesk um, at all. We only learned Pro-E and uh, SolidWorks. So it was difficult to get in there um, and have a totally new system, although it's all pretty much the same. It's very easy to transition. If you can do SolidWorks, Inventor is very similar, as you've probably seen or will see. Um, however, from going to several training courses uh, with Autodesk, uh, and working with au the Autodesk products for a few years, I think I prefer Autodesk. It's just um, the things that it does well, or it does a lot of things better than SolidWorks. Um, SolidWorks has some uh, features that Autodesk doesn't have, or Inventor doesn't have, I should say. But um, I think, in general, the Autodesk stuff works better, just in my preference. <coughs> Ah, oh, thank you very much.